Today's counterculture and alternative movements often reflect a desire to question and reject mainstream norms, like those seen as putting too much value on material possessions and wealth. These are ideas which may seem typical of modern-day societies, but listen to this description of the Cynics, a group of philosophers from ancient Greece, the earliest of whom lived nearly two and a half thousand years ago. They live frugally, eat only as much as is necessary for their well-being, wear only one cloak, and despise wealth, reputation and noble birth. Some Cynics at least are vegetarian, drink only cold water, and take cover in whatever shelter presents itself, including large storage jars, as did Diogenes. He used to say that it is the God's business to lack nothing, but for God-like people to need only a little. The Cynics, of whom Diogenes of Sinope is the best known, were not your usual kind of philosophers. Rather than lecturing or writing about their ideas, they would point out the absurdity of many human endeavours, like greed and hypocrisy, by enacting their beliefs through the way they lived out their lives, almost like performance artists. And that's what's kept their ideas alive to this day. To help us understand what the Cynics stood for, I'm joined by three eminent scholars of Greek philosophy. Dr. Elena Cagnoli Fiaconi, lecturer in ancient philosophy at University College London. Dr. William Desmond, senior lecturer in ancient classics at Maynooth University in Ireland and author of several books on the cynics. And Mark Usher, professor of classical languages and literature at the University of Vermont in the United States. Mark has just published some new translations of writings about the cynics from classical antiquity and will be sampling them in this programme. But before we get to that, I want to ask, how close is the meaning of the words a cynic and cynical, as we understand them today, to what they meant in ancient Greece? Mark. So uh, cynic in ancient Greek means dog-like, kunikos in Greek. And the cynics were called dogs because um, they did all their private behavior in public view, shamelessly. And so it was a term of reproach that people uh, used to describe the cynics. That's where the term comes from. Today, we use the term cynical to describe somebody who uh, perhaps looks down their nose at other people and, you know, maybe flouts conventional norms and criticizes things, but usually has no solutions for um, the problems that uh, he or she describes. The cynics, I think, were different than that. They believe that you could change your behavior, and they sort of, as you say, enacted their philosophy as a way of life to try to make themselves better. So, in some ways, the cynics were idealists and optimists. Elena. Yeah, so there are many differences between ancient cynicism and what we might call today cynical. And I think beyond the differences, perhaps, there is still some point of similarity in that, for example, um, the ancient cynics, as we will see, show a desire to be witty and to uncover false appearances. And this is an attitude that we find also in people nowadays who claim or are characterized as cynics. Anything you want to add, Will? I think the word cynic can be thrown around in English a lot and has many different meanings. Maybe the main meaning is that of a person who sees the worst motive at work in other people, that other people profess to live by some noble motive or or for some goal, which is praiseworthy, but they in fact don't. The ancient cynics probably are not understood in these terms. And as Mark said, uh, they're in some ways extremely optimistic about uh, human potentiality for happiness and morality. So we have the same word for the two groups, as it were, but um, they're probably quite different in the end. Well, that's very useful to elucidate at the start. I mentioned performance artists, and one of the stories often told about that most famous of the Cynic philosophers, Diogenes of Sinope, is that he would sometimes behave like a dog at a party, quite literally like a dog. Tell us more about that, Mark. 
Yeah, we have many anecdotes about his dog-like behavior. One of the characteristic uh, dog-like traits that the cynics exhibited was that they, they begged for their food. And uh, on one occasion, Diogenes was doing that routine, and some uh, roughneck hooligans threw him some bones, uh, scraps from the table, as if he were a dog. And so Diogenes, in return, dog-like, lifted his leg and uh, weed on them. <laughs> To put it uh, politely, there are many anecdotes where the cynics owned that sobriquet dog-like and uh, kind of turned it back on their interlocutors. And why would Diogenes do this, Elena, act like a dog deliberately, flaunt it even? I think there were possibly two purposes for this. So the first was surely to shock and the second um, is to educate, to teach people how um, they should live in a way. And the cynics and Diogenes did that not by giving lectures on what living naturally means, but in a way they did it by public display, something that was intended to be visible and to have an immediate impact. And the lesson I think that one was supposed to draw um, is that one should free oneself from customs and follow nature. So, in a way, William, would you say that this was his way of pointing out how absurd some social customs can be? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Elena nailed it on the head there, contrasting nature and custom, which is a big um, kind of dichotomy within classical Greek culture. And the cynics came along as uh, very radical in criticising customs and praising nature. So, if we look through anecdotes, not only about Diogenes, you know, urinating in public, but also his attacks on other customs, we uh, kind of see a pattern that uh, he seems to have rejected uh, customs from all aspects of life. So Diogenes inaugurated the cynic uniform, as it were, that um, he wore the simplest of clothing, which was just a simple tunic without any shoes or any other coverings. He and other cynics would reject jewellery and any kind of bodily adornment. They didn't shave, so they were, became famous for their beards, unkept beards, and they didn't bathe. All of these are Greek customs. They notoriously didn't eat meat, which would involve cooking, and the use of fire, which was seen as kind of the way of separating natural life from human civilized life. Without meat, they were seemingly probably vegetarians, um, eating beans as one of their favourite foods and drinking water rather than wine. So the rejection of wine is kind of a real kind of criticism of Greek customs. The list goes on really. Um, one of the main ways that they rejected Greek culture was their rejection of the house or the home and the family. They didn't live in houses but um, lived fairly nomadic lives in the streets of Athens and other cities. The cynics themselves seems to have understood this as one of their main ideas, even though, as Elena said, um, they didn't really formulate it abstractly as a critique of custom. But um, there was a cynic motto, which is to deface the currency of custom. So the idea is that customs are like coins, and a cynic educates other people by defacing the customs, um, putting them out of circulation, like you would put out bad coinage out of circulation in the economy. We think Diogenes lived in the 4th century BC, but as with so many other philosophers of antiquity, we don't have any writings by the cynics themselves, or even anything about them from the time when they lived. What we do have is a collection of stories about them, and about many other philosophers of antiquity, which was written hundreds of years later. It's called Lives of Eminent Philosophers, and we'll discuss how reliable it is later in the programme. Incidentally, the writer is known as another Diogenes, Diogenes Laertius. Now, Diogenes the philosopher, acting like a dog, may have been amusing to party guests, but for the cynics it had a deeper meaning. A dog, especially a dog in ancient times, was a pretty self-sufficient creature. He would roam as he pleased, snatch scraps of food where he could, sleep in whatever shelter he could find, and luxuriate in the warm sunshine. 
Which brings us to another often told story about Diogenes. This time it's about him being visited by Alexander III of Macedon, the powerful king and military general better known as Alexander the Great, who ruled over a huge empire in Europe and Asia. While Diogenes was sunbathing amongst the cypress trees in Corinth, mainland Greece, Alexander stood in front of him and said, Ask me for whatever you want. To which Diogenes replied, Get out of my sunshine! Eleanor, it must take quite a lot of nerve to rebuke the most powerful man of one's time so bluntly. But beyond the calculated insult, what was Diogenes trying to say here, do you think? Let me just start by saying that um, this story has come to us through many different traditions. And so uh, there is an element of doubt that we might have about its truth. So we don't know if this is something that Diogenes actually did. But going back to what is reported about him in, in telling Alexander to get out of his sunshine, surely he's saying, I don't recognize your role in authority, Alexander. And I am free because your authority and role mean nothing to me. And so there is nothing that you can do for me or to me, right? You cannot harm me and you cannot do me favors. However, you're taking away the sunshine from me and sunshine is part of what makes my life good. It is free for everyone to get and it is more precious than wealth, fancy clothes, even a house, right? So he is in a way telling Alexander that he doesn't recognize his authority and at the same time he's teaching him a lesson about what matters and what matters is not having power, being a king, um, being wealthy, but what matters is living in accordance to nature. William, we should mention perhaps that for the first few hundred years, Cynic philosophy was very much an oral tradition. Stories passed down from generation to generation. And several hundred years passed between the supposed death of Diogenes in 323 BC and the earliest known writings about his life and thoughts. And yet we have these stories being passed on. So do we have an idea why this tale about Diogenes and Alexander, whether it's true or not, so appealed to the Greeks and then to the Romans that they kept passing it on and preserving it. I think this is one of the most famous Diogenes stories, probably because it touches upon something archetypal. We have Diogenes, the philosopher, a man of words, not a political person on the one hand. And on the other, we have Alexander, who is the great conqueror of antiquity, um, a great king, a warrior, and political leader. So we have two very different lives brought into contrast with each other, and Diogenes gets the better of the great man. So when you look at some of the details of the story, it's um, Diogenes comes across as, in fact, the more powerful and even the more kingly of the two. is sitting while Alexander stands, and uh, he has enough wealth, as it were, the wealth of sunshine, gold and sunshine, to be able to refuse the offer of Alexander's wealth. The notion of the philosopher versus the king is um, a kind of an archetype which many cultures and many different times can tap into in their own way. And later Greeks did live under kings. Um, so this contrast between the spiritual or the moral philosopher and the, the worldly powerful king was a very prevalent one and that was continued then into the Roman Empire which had its own very powerful emperors but it also had its cynic philosophers who sometimes actually criticised Roman magistrates and even emperors. So it comes down to the modern world and the phrase speaking truth to power so that may be one of the um, reasons that it's a very popular story among those who are not kings or emperors, that uh, Diogenes stands up for the little person, as it were, and um, gets the better of the world conqueror. As we alluded to in the opening quote of the programme, the aim of many of the ancient cynics was a simple life, stripped back to the barest minimum. Quite how radically Diogenes pursued simplicity is illustrated by a story about him watching a child drinking water and learning something from it. Mark, tell us what happened in this story. <laughs> Again, many anecdotes about uh, about that aspect of cynic life as well. The cynics had their 
their own sort of get up and their own sort of costume, which included a satchel where they carried a drinking cup, which also served as a receptacle to take their food. And they had a walking stick and a single cloak that served also as like a sleeping bag. Uh, They slept in it as well as wore it when it was cold. And Diogenes saw a child using his cupped hands to drink water from a fountain. And then he saw another child use a a hunk of bread hollowed out to take his lentils for food. And he said, a child has beaten me in simplicity. And so he cast his cup away. So the less is more attitude that the cynics really brought to everything became sort of a competition against themselves to see how little they could do with. This may seem like a radically minimalist approach to life if we compare it to today's Western affluence. But in Greece, 2000 or more years ago, there must have been many people who had literally nothing. So in that context, perhaps it's not as radical as it appears, Elena. That's right. So in a way, the life of the cynic might have seen not much difference from the lives of those who were very poor in ancient Greece and perhaps um, also in ancient Rome. But I think the cynics were radical in that they embraced poverty, right? So they made a point of living well with nothing and achieving freedom and happiness in part because of it. And so on the one hand, they could function as um, quasi-heroic sources of inspiration for the less well-off. And at the same time, they also managed to criticize the wealthy, who in fact, in comparison, had quite a lot and lived in luxury or in what was luxurious at the time. And I think one of the points that the cynics try to make by living in poverty is that um, the luxuries that the wealthy have in a way become needs. And one, in fact, is better off without them because luxuries basically fill us up with desires that can never be sated. And so once we start indulging in them, uh, we never attain satisfaction. And so it's better to embrace poverty than to live in a luxurious way. The cynics repeatedly pointed out that money can't buy you happiness, to use a modern paraphrase. Here's how one of them put it in a short dialogue, sometimes wrongly attributed to the second century AD writer Lucian. Embroidered robes can keep you no warmer. Gilt houses cannot provide more shelter. Cups of gold and silver don't help the taste of drink. Nor do beds carved from ivory offer you sound asleep. To the contrary, you will often see the well-off lying upon an ivory bed with expensive sheets, unable to get a wink of sleep. And not only does elaborate fuss over preparation of food not nourish you better, but such cuisine harms bodies and causes disease. On the one hand, this sounds like common sense advice. But on the other, it was a standard Roman literary trope to complain about the excesses and luxury lifestyles of the rich. So, William, does this explain the enduring popularity of cynic thought well into the time of the Roman Empire, do you think? Yes, it does. It's one of the reasons um, that explains its enduring popularity. Of course, as the saying goes, there's nothing so uncommon as common sense. So, um, avoiding harmful luxury seems like a sensible course of action, but uh, it's something which doesn't often happen. In the Roman world, especially in the Roman Empire, there was incredible wealth that existed side by side with uh, great poverty. So the lifestyle of wealthy senators and knights and the emperor, of course, um, would absolutely dwarf that of um, the poorest members of society. Roman society was deeply hierarchical, but even some of the very wealthy seem to have felt perhaps guilty, about their um, position. So we have a philosopher like Seneca, for instance, who is a very wealthy advisor to the emperor Nero. But uh, in his writings, he often harkens back to cynic philosophers and also to one of his contemporaries, who is a cynic philosopher called Demetrius. And Seneca praises Demetrius for actually living out ideals of frugality and simplicity and avoiding frivolities like crystal goblets and marble tables and um, other luxuries which certainly do not bring happiness but in fact can be very dangerous because they can attract the attention of one's enemies or of robbers and even of a jealous emperor. 
There's a striking passage in the same 2nd century AD work where the author, whoever they were, points out the big social costs of conspicuous consumption. You think it's fine to use goods from all over the world and not just what you have close to hand. You don't think your own land and sea are enough in themselves, but import your pleasures from the corners of the globe and always prefer what is foreign to what is produced locally, what is costly to what is inexpensive, and what's hard to procure to what's easily acquired. The many costly goods you think conducive to your happiness, over which you exult, only come to you through misery and suffering. Think about the gold you pray so hard to get your hands on, the silver, the expensive houses, the finely tailored clothing. How much do they cost in human labor and danger, or rather, in human blood, death and destruction? Not only because many people are lost at sea for the sake of these things, and the people who search them out or manufacture them suffer terribly, but also because these items are much fought over. We're now familiar with the concept of conspicuous consumption, but I wonder if the cynics might sometimes have given the impression that they were superior to the ordinary people because of what might be called their conspicuous display of virtue. <laughs> what do you think, Eleanor? So that's a very good point. And in fact, uh, we might wonder if the cynics were uh, guilty of what we might call a form of virtue signaling, you know, the sort of behavior that uh, one may engage in public in order to make show of one's virtues without necessarily being committed to the same behavior privately. So, uh, for example, think of politicians who posture as, um, you know, living frugally like the rest of us, while in fact they might have um, lots of assistance or they may be very wealthy or live in mansions and so on. So I think that cynicism at its truest and best is really not a kind of virtue signaling. It's not about... Um, signaling one's virtue as a way to show superiority um, to other people. It is more about acting as an example, sometimes in a shocking way, so that people can adopt a more virtuous lifestyle. However, in the literature, there are some discussions and criticism of uh, people who postured as cynics without really being cynics. And so we talked about him earlier, Lucian, a comedic writer, often um, chastises those who pose as cynics while in fact they're after mundane um, favors or handouts or pleasures. So there are some accounts of people who sort of pretended to be cynics without really embracing the values that the cynic did embrace. So the cynics were clearly keen to draw attention to the human greed and vanity they saw all around them. And because of their closely guarded independence, they saw themselves as the conscience of their communities. But what did that mean in practice? We'll try to answer that question in the second part of this forum, coming up on the BBC World Service in a couple of minutes. This is the BBC World Service. And when the dark is rising, who will hold it back? The dark, the evil, third 